So my presentation is about the management practices that we might do to lambs and kids. Doesn't mean we're gonna do all of them, but we might do them and we have to decide if we're gonna do them. So these are the five practices that I'm gonna talk about. So I like to say stuff we might do to young lambs and kids. So I'm talking about doing it when they're young, you know, the first week or two, not things we might do later on, but some of the things we do if we get lambs or kids when they're young, or if we uh, breed our does and ewes and we, and we raise some lambs and kids. So tubing, docking, castrating, disbudding, and identifying. So I'm gonna talk about, first of all, whether you should do that practice at all. I have a flock of sheep and I can tell you, I only do two of those practices. One only if I need to, and one I always do. So you have to decide whether you should do it. Then you need to decide when you should do it. Well, generally speaking, I'm saying that these things should be done very young within the first week or two, but there are some cases where you might do it or a little bit later, or even within the first week or two, there are best times to do it. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about how you do it. So should you do it? When should you do it? And how should you do it? So the first practice we're gonna talk about is tubing. And that's not putting a raft on the river and going tubing. Tubing is a means of providing nutrition to an animal through a stomach tube. Of course, we do similar thing with people as well. When we talk about tubing, the first thing we need to consider is which lambs or kids might need nutritional support. In Megan's presentation a, a week ago, when she talked about bottle feeding, she talked about some of the same things. What may cause you to bottle feed a lamb or kid? And obviously, if the mother dies or is un otherwise unavailable for nursing, you're gonna have to provide nourishment to that lamb or kid. Sometimes the mother doesn't have enough milk. Usually that's because she either has mastitis which is an utter infection that causes her to have no milk or not as much milk as she could, or she has a large litter. A large litter could be just two lambs for a yearling, or it could be three or four for a mature female. Sometimes there, there's a disproportion in the size of the babies. Maybe you have a nine and 10 pound lamb, and then you have a four pounder. And that little one has a hard time competing with his bigger siblings to get enough milk. Sometimes the ewe or doe rejects one or more of her offspring. There are ways to try to get her to accept them, but they're not always successful and you might not have the time to dedicate to do that. We don't always know exactly why they reject them, but it does happen. Sometimes you wanna separate the baby so that you can milk the mother. This is particularly true with dairy goats. Um, if you wanna milk the mother, you take the baby off and you artificially rear that baby. Sometimes you separate the babies for disease management, in particular for goats, uh, to try to eradicate CAE from your herd. Now CAE stands for caprine arthritic encephalitis. And so it is primarily transmitted to the kid through the colostrum. And so you remove the kid and feed the kid heated colostrum. Sometimes, as Megan mentioned in the last meeting, you may buy a, <clears throat> a dairy goat or dairy doe as an orphan or you may buy a pet as an orphan, and so you have to bottle feed it. And then there are those that are simply too weak, or they're unable to nurse, or they won't take a bottle. So there's two ways to get nourishment to these animals. Of course, the traditional way is through bottle feeding. Bottle feeding is more natural. When an animal drinks from a bottle, the milk flows into the abomasum, which is the true stomach of a ruminant and keep in mind that when a baby a baby lamb and a baby goat they are really pre-ruminants that ruminant reticulum is not yet functioning so we want the milk to go into the abomasum it's also why they need very nutritious feed <clears throat> when we start to creep feed them bottle feeding of course mimics suckling from the dam most people just about everybody is comfortable bottle feeding a lamb or kid and very often, or not very often, almost always those lambs and kids will bond to people. And that could be very important to you. The other way to get nourishment is through tubing. When we tube, the milk goes into the rumen. 
initially you would think, well, that's not a good thing. We want the milk to go into the abomasum. But when they've done research, and this has been with calves, they have determined that it's, it's fine. There's no difference between tubing and bottle feeding. The amount of immunoglobulins is the same regardless of the method. When you tube, they don't bond to you. They don't hate what you're doing. They appreciate the nourishment usually, but they don't like the method as much. So they don't bond to you. Again, that could be good. It just depends on what you want. Tubing is a more efficient way of getting milk into lambs and kids. It doesn't take as long. It ensures that they get enough milk. And then you see where I have circled. Some lambs and kids are too weak to nurse from even a bottle. Too weak to nurse from their dam, too weak to nurse from a bottle. And sometimes they need milk, but they won't take a bottle or they won't drink enough milk. And those are the ones that we need to tube. Okay, here's the equipment that we need for tube feeding. It's pretty simple, it's pretty inexpensive. The first thing we need is a syringe to hold the milk, a vessel to hold the milk. That syringe needs to have a catheter tip on it so that we can attach the tube. Typically, we use either a 60 or 140 cc syringe, as you see pictured here. The second piece of equipment we need is a stomach tube. Stomach tubes come in different sizes in terms of how long they are, how wide their diameter is. There's usually two primary kinds. One is a clear plastic uh, tube. That one is easier to insert, but on a real small, delicate uh, baby, it could potentially cause, more likely to cause an injury. And then there's the red rubber, the flexible tubes. Uh, they're not as easy, uh, but they work, they work well. And then you can see the picture on the right. This is called a trusty tuber. I bought one of these a few years ago. It combines the tube and the vessel in the same piece of equipment. It's really easy to hold. I really like uh, using this instead of a syringe and a tube. Sometimes you, you need it, feel like you need another hand when you're using a syringe and a tube, whereas the trusty tuber really works quite nicely. So the first thing you have to be concerned about when tube feeding is the milk. I'm not gonna talk about the different sources of colostrum or the different sources of milk replacer because Megan covered that in the last meeting, but basically for a young uh, baby or one that needs help, we're gonna wanna warm the milk to body temperature, which is, a, which is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for the case, in the case of colostrum, we're gonna wanna warm it in a hot water bath, like you see in the picture, and not in the microwave. The microwave can kill the antibodies. If it's milk replacer, we're gonna mix it according to the uh, directions on the bag, and usually that is gonna be sufficiently warm. We wanna get our equipment together. We wanna make sure it's clean and sanitized. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna place that tube alongside the animal's body to see how far we need to insert it to reach the last rib. We can't go too far when we're tubing, but we can go not far enough. We may be tubing a three pound kid, or we may be tubing a 15 pound lamb. So we really gotta see how far we need to take that tube. You can restrain the animal in different ways. I usually sit on a bale of straw. Some people will kneel and put the lamb or kid between their knees. You need to hold the head in a natural position and extend its neck. Then dip the tube in clean water. I will sometimes dip it in milk. You insert the tube in the animal's mouth. I usually go along the side. The animal should swallow the tube readily. Now keep in mind, he'll still be able to bleat or cry and he may chew on the tube. It just depends on how vigorous that lamb or kid is, how hungry he is. I've had some so hungry, they still won't take a bottle, but they're so hungry, they, it practically seems like they're taking a bottle through the, tube, through the tube. Once you've got the tube inserted, then you attach the syringe to the mouth of the feeding tube. You fill the tube with milk. And just like you see in the picture, you let the milk go into the baby's stomach via gravity. It will just gradually flow out. How fast? It depends. It depends on how thick the milk is. Uh, it depends on some different things. After all the milk is emptied, then you crimp off the end of the tube and slowly remove the tube. Sounds simple, right? Couple of precautions about tube feeding. The first precaution is 
you shouldn't tube feed a hyperthermic lamb or kid that's under five hours of age. 99 degrees Fahrenheit is considered hypothermic, so anything cooler than that. And a young baby, you should warm it before you tube feed it. If that same baby can't lift its head or swallow, even after warming, you shouldn't tube it. You should give it an injection of warm glucose into its body cavity. If the kid or lamb is over five hours of age, normally you give it that injection of glucose first. So for these hypothermic babies, there are steps you need to follow when you decide what to do. It's important to clean the equipment. It's easy to clean it. You should clean it, dry it before going from one baby to the next or one day to the next. You don't want to spread diseases with unsanitized equipment. I think Megan emphasized in her presentation on bottle babies, cleaning the equipment or the bottles is so very important. Obviously, one of the biggest fears is that you will insert the tube into the trachea, into the lungs, as opposed to the esophagus. That's the biggest fear that people have. And there's different things you can do to make sure you don't do that. You can use the plunger of the syringe to see if you have proper placement. If you're able to pull back on that plunger, then you're probably in the wrong place. You can also feel and see the tube as you insert it and it goes down into the esophagus. If the lamb reacts violently, the kid reacts violently, they cough, they gag, then you know you're in the wrong place and you need to remove the tube. Premier, which is a company that sells supplies, they recommend that instead of holding the head level, like you see in this picture, that you tilt the head back while tubing. And they say this helps to avoid going into the windpipe. And if you look on their website, when they give instructions on tubing, they have a series of pictures and they've got the head tilted up. It's important not to ram the milk into the stomach with the plunger. Some people do use the plunger when they tube feed. Most, it's generally recommended that you don't, but if you do, you just wanna make sure you don't ram it in there because sometimes colostrum is so thick, both the kind that the mama produces as well as the kind that you buy, that I can tell you that it's not gonna flow with gravity. You're gonna need to use the plunger, but you wanna do it very slowly and very gently. In fact, everything about tubing needs to be gentle. These are typically newborn babies. They are very delicate and you need to be gentle. In a lot of cases, the baby that needs tubed would prob will probably die if you don't tube it. So if you're afraid, keep that in mind. But you can, uh, this is something that everybody can learn to do and it can save their baby's lives. So this is a practice that I sometimes do on my farm, not because I want to, but because I need to, to save the babies, to make sure they get enough milk, make sure they get enough colostrum, make sure they get off to a good start. Okay, second practice I'm gonna talk about is docking. And obviously this doesn't pertain to those of you who have goats. Docking means to shorten, not remove the sheep's tail. A little bit about sheep's tails. They are born with them. They can't be a bad thing. The sheep's tail protects its anus, vulva, and udder from weather extremes. They can lift their tail to some extent when they poop, to help scatter their feces. The tail does not interfere with breeding or with lambing. However, selection has resulted in longer, woollier tails that sheep can't lift easily. The sheep on the right is a hair sheep, and you can see he has complete control of his tail. It's not nearly as long, not nearly as thick, and not woolly. The sheep on the left has a long, thick, woolly tail, a quite pretty tail, but he doesn't have the ability to move that tail. And so that's what's happened over time. Originally, sheep did not have long, thick, woolly tails. As we selected for wool production, we got these long, thick, woolly tails. They're actually trying to breed sheep that have shorter tails that don't need docking. Years ago, they were able to create sheep born without tails. But unfortunately, it was kind of like the Manx cat. 
that trait was actually linked to a lethal trait. So that didn't work. So now what they're doing is breeding uh, sheep with normal sized tails to breeds with short tails. Tail length is actually the most heritable trait in sheep. It's almost 90% heritable. Lambs usually have tail length in between their sire and their dam. So why do we dock tails? Well, I think that picture shows you exactly why we dock the tails of sheep. Docking prevents the fecal matter from accumulating on the tail and the hindquarters. It greatly reduces the incidence of fly strike or blow flies, which can be fatal. Docking makes it easier to shear, milk, and harvest sheep. It makes it easier to see things, to see the vulva and udders of the ewes. When you go out to look to see if they're ready to lamb and you're looking at a, something like this, you can't see anything. Docking is required to show not all breeds, but most breeds and almost all, and, and certainly market lambs. So it's generally recommended that lambs from the wold breeds be docked, especially if you're gonna keep them in the flock, especially if they're gonna be sold as feeder lambs, meaning someone else is gonna fatten them, or if they go to grass with their mamas. Those animals should be docked. Why wouldn't you dock a sheep? Well, some breeds don't require tail docking. The picture here shows some Barbados black belly sheep in the Caribbean. These lambs, this breed does not require docking. Katahdin, St. Croix, hare sheep do not require docking. There's a group of sheep we call rat-tailed. These are breeds that come from Northern Europe, Scandinavia, uh, breeds such as the Romanoff, the Shetland, the Soy, the East Frisian, the Finn. We do not need to dock these breeds. And then there's fat-tailed or fat rump sheep. We don't have those in the United States so much, but those are typically not docked. If the lambs are harvested at a young age, some people produce lambs to sell at Easter or Christmas time, and those lambs are just a couple of months old, it's not necessary to dock those tails. If your management system keeps the hindquarters of your animals clean, it may not be necessary to dock lambs, especially the males. And some markets actually prefer a lamb that hasn't been docked, what we call an unblemished lamb. One of the biggest demands of the year for sheep meat is during the Muslim holiday, the festival of sacrifice. It's at the end of July, and they prefer an intact male with a tail. So here's the tools that we use for docking lambs. As you can see, there are different tools. They have different prices. I've got the illustrator circle because that's the most common method of docking lambs, but these are some other things that you can use. So the illustrator or bander or ringer is a bloodless method of docking. You put the, the band over the caudal tail fold and you release and leave that band on there. The band cuts off the blood supply, causing it to uh, shrivel up and, and atrophy and fall off. An electric docker or hot iron is another bloodless method of docking. It's actually my preferred method. It's a specialized tool that cuts and cauterizes the tail at the same time. It can be used on a little bit older lamb. The burdizo uh, and knife, it crushes it, cuts and crushes at the same time. So you use the, the burdizo to crush and you use the um, knife to cut but it's, blood, it's fairly bloodless. A masculator is simply a tool that cuts and crushes at the same time. Uh, a knife or all-in-one, these are basically uh, cutting. You're simply cutting the tail off. Uh, the all-in-one has a blade on it. Uh, you can get excessive bleeding with this method. You can see I've got it in red, and this method is not recommended as a method of tail docking. A little bit about docking with the elastrator, which is the most common method. One of the most important things is this lamb be protected against tetanus. Banding pro poses the greatest tetanus risk because when you put that band on and that tail kind of dies, it's going to be hanging there for a while. You can cut it off and that's a good practice, but it, the, the area under the band is an anaerobic environment that's very conducive for the tetanus organism. That lamb needs to get passive immunity from the colostrum from its mother or it needs to get active immunity from vaccination. Vaccination uh, 
active immunity most likely needs to come from the tetanus antitoxin. If you didn't vaccinate the mom, then you should use the tetanus antitoxin. Steps for docking with an elastrator is to obviously restrain the lamb. You can either have him, you can see both ways. He can be, the tail can be both ways. You stretch out the band, slide it over the tail. Uh, the little picture shows a really good placement of that band. You release the handle and slide the tool out. When you set that lamb down, um, that you get various reactions. Some lambs act like nothing's happened and some um, are worthy of an Academy Award because it really bothers them. As I mentioned, do you do the practice? When do you do it? When you do dock lambs is as young as possible to reduce stress and the risk of complications. One to seven days of age is the recommended age, especially if you're using those bands. Now, you don't want to do it in the first 24 hours. You don't want to interfere with bonding between the mother and the lambs. You don't want to reduce the colostrum intake. So within the first week, but starting with the second day. All methods of docking should be done by the time they are six weeks of age. Again, banding earlier. Older docking, over three months of age, if you, it's done, it should be done by a veterinarian with the animal uh, receiving some sort of pain relief. There is a bander that's called a calicrate bander. I showed that in the earlier picture that uses more of a high tension band. They have advocated this tool for docking older and bigger lambs. But the best thing to do is to dock these babies when they are very young. It's less stress for them, less risk of complications. It's easier for you. The length of the tail dock is important. Remember, you are not removing the tail, you are shortening it. Most countries around the world say that you should leave the stub long enough to cover the used vulva and the ram's anus. If you look at the picture on the right, that's a proper tail dock length. You, these are males and that tail is covering their anus. In the United States, we go with the idea of no shorter than the distal or furthest end of the caudal tail fold. And the picture on the left, it shows that. The green one is where that band should be replaced. This is the recommendation of the American Veterinary Medical Association, as well as the American Sheep Industry Association. There are joints in the tail, and the third palpable joint, or to the tip of the vulva, is a, another way of looking at that recommendation. The, more, the closer you place that band to the body, the more painful it is. Short tail docking damages muscles and nerves, and it contributes to the incidence of rectal prolapses and other problems. Welfare considerations for docking. All tail docking causes pain, regardless of method or age. Surgical docking is the most painful, and it is not recommended that tails be cut off with a knife. The response to pain in banded lambs, as I mentioned, it's variable. It goes from no reaction at all to significant reaction. And it, it seems to be affected by where you place the band. One way to reduce the pain when banding is to combine banding with crushing, using that clamp or that burdizo to crush and band at the same time. I don't know if I mentioned it previously, but the electric docker or hot iron is probably the most humane method of docking. And again, it can be done in a little bit older lamb, whereas banding should be done in that first week. There is absolutely no justification for ultra short tail docking that you see among some show animals. This is done for cosmetic reasons only, and, there's, and it really just shouldn't be done. One way to reduce pain, and this is getting attention around the world, is, is to use uh, local anesthetics such as lidocaine or uh, non-steroid antidepressants. There are products in other countries that can be used. Unfortunately, here you'd need to have a veterinarian prescribe. And as I already mentioned with banding, but this is true with all methods of tail docking, docking there should be protection against tetanus. Okay, let's talk about castration, the next management practice. Castration is removal or destruction of the testicles. Why castrate? There's a whole list of reasons here, primarily because you want to prevent indiscriminate breeding. You want to decide who and when breeds. 
you want to, in many cases, you want to eliminate the behavior of the male, the odor of the male. Weathers are easier to manage, they're easier to shear. Obviously, if your child wants to show a market lamb, it must be a weather. Some markets actually prefer weathers. Weathers are cleaner and easier to process. There is some indication that rams may have some taint to the meat or, or bucks. Wool producers, particularly the, the ones in the world that produce fine wool, weathers produce better, finer wool. Castration is a traditional practice, and sometimes we do things for tradition, and we doesn't mean we should, but sometimes that's our reason. And obviously, if you're gonna keep a sheep or goat as a pet, it should be castrated. Again, you wanna eliminate those behavioral issues. Why might you not castrate? This particularly true of people, those of you in the audience who might be raising these animals for production purposes, even if you do it on a small scale. Males grow faster and they produce leaner carcasses. Some seed stock producers want to see how the male grows out. You know, is he worth keeping as a breeding male? Some markets prefer the intact male. I already mentioned the Muslim holiday at the end of July has a preference for an intact male. Uh, folks from the uh, Caribbean islands, particularly Jamaica, have a strong preference for an intact male. If you're gonna market your animals at a very young age, and not as young as what I said about tail docking, but if you can market these males before they reach puberty, then there's really no need to castrate them. Now, that doesn't mean they can't do some hanky-panky a little, or not so much breed, but just from a behavioral standpoint. So you might want to separate them, but if you can market them before they really go through puberty and start to be develop those male characteristics, you really don't need to castrate them. Here's the methods of, of castration. I say band, crush, or cut is basically what we're doing. They're some of the same tools with the exception of the electric hot iron. Again, I have a lastrator circle because this is the primary method uh, that we use to castrate males. I have one mention of the Burdizo, which is probably the most humane method of castration of these choices. You need to make sure you use what they call the baby Burdizo. You need to use one that's appropriate size for lambs and, and kids, not the one that's used on cattle. Surgical castration, which I'll talk about in a minute, a little bit more acceptable for castration where it's not really acceptable for docking. So again, uh, the elastrator is a bloodless method. We band above the testicles, they atrophy and fall off. You are left with no scrotum. When you use the Burdizo, it's also bloodless. You crush both of the spermatic cords one at a time. You do not try to do the whole thing. Those testicles will shrink but you will get a little scrotum. This technique probably requires the most skill. Another traditional method of castrating, particularly lambs, is to do it surgically with a knife or scalpel. The lower third of the scrotum is cut off, the testicles are pulled out, and the wound is allowed to heal naturally. The all-in-one tool will, is another method to do this. If you've ever watched that show Dirty Jobs, Dirtiest Jobs, I think they've had on there where they show where people actually would use their teeth to pull the testicles out. That's where this method comes into play. It, there is a greater risk of bleeding and infection, but probably our, our biggest concern is fly strike. So if this method is used, it's perfectly suitable in the winter, but as you get into fly season, it's not a common method. In the East, we largely use the elastrator. In the West, sometimes they still use the surgical method. So castrating with an elastrator, again, just to emphasize, so very important that that lamb or kid be protected against tetanus. Ideally, mom is vaccinated and they get passive immunity that lasts for the first six to eight weeks of their life. If mom was not vaccinated, then the tetanus antitoxin should be used at the time of castration. It provides immediate short-term immunity. When we're castrating, we usually put the kid or lamb on his back, as you can see here. Uh, we gently grasp the scrotum and move the testicles to the base of the scrotum. We slide the elastrator over top of it 
and close it around the scrotum, making sure the two testicles are below the band and making sure we're not over top of the nipples of the lamb. And then we roll the rings off the testicles. When we're done, again, check to make sure that you got two testicles. What age should you castrate? Just like docking, as young as possible to reduce stress and the risk of complications. The recommendation is one to seven days of age. As soon as the testicles have descended into the scrotum, this is particularly important for banding. Again, don't do it in the first 24 hours of life so as not to interfere with bonding and colostrum intake. At the same time of docking, if it's a lamb, don't put them through this stuff twice. Do docking and castrating at the same time. All methods of castration should be done by the time the baby's baby, again, especially banding. Older castration, over three months of age, should be done by a veterinarian with pain relief provided to the lamb or kid. I've mentioned this calicrate bander with these high tension bands. They have been advocated for doing older, bigger animals. Some welfare considerations, all methods of castration cause pain, regardless of age. Surgical is the most painful method of castration and should not be done during fly season. How do we know it's the most painful? When they look at different methods of castration, they measure the level of cortisol in the blood and it's highest for surgical. Clamping with the burdizo is the least painful and can be done a little bit later than banding. Just like tail docking, if you combine clamping with banding, that reduces the pain. The calicrate bander, they claim to be more humane, but I'm not aware of any actual proof. Pain can be reduced for the in the same way as it can with docking, uh, with local anesthetics and anti-inflammatory drugs. Again, a veterinary would need to be involved. Again, protection against tetanus. What about early castration and urinary calculi? A lot of Facebook groups will tell you, you know, you can't castrate these animals when they're young. You're gonna have problems with urinary calculi. Well, urinary calculi is a blockage in the urinary tract of ruminants. It occurs in males, rarely in females. Males have a longer, curvier uh, urinary tract. Weathers are more prone, or at least this is the belief, is because their urethras have a smaller diameter than intact males because of the loss of the influence of testosterone. So when you castrate, you either remove or destroy the testicles, which is the source of the male hormone testosterone. So that's the theory. So there's a concern that early castration causes urinary calculi. Well, there is no proof that this is true. Because in reality, urinary calculi is a nutritional problem. It's almost always caused by improper feeding, too much phosphorus in the diet, and or an improper ratio of calcium to phosphorus. I even read a paper that said it's not even necessarily more common in weathers than it is in intact males. It's just that weathers are more likely to be fed the diets that cause urinary calculi. So if you're concerned about urinary calculi, here's how you prevent it in all sheep and goats. Proper feeding. No excess phosphorus in the diet. There's plenty of phosphorus in grain. There's plenty of phosphorus in most of the things we feed. There's no reason to add too much. For our male sheep and goats, that ratio of calcium to phosphorus needs to be at least two to one. Most of the, kid, the stones, the bladder stones, are from phosphate salts. It is possible from, to, have, to be caused by too much calcium, but that is rare. It is primarily grain and too much phosphorus. So you look at something like corn or soybean meal, they have a much higher amount of phosphorus relative to calcium. So it's too much grain that we're feeding. We need to make sure these male sheep and goats have a source of roughage in the diet. And roughage in the diet isn't because somebody says there's something in the feed. No, roughage means long stem, hay and or pasture. They, all of them should have that in their diet. They need a constant source of fresh, clean water. They need to drink 
plenty of water. In the winter time, we need to make sure the water is not freezing. In the summertime, we need to make sure it's cool and clean so they'll drink it. We need enough salt in their diet. Salt will encourage them to drink more water. We can add ammonium chloride to the diet. It will acidify the urine and help to dissolve the stones. Most goat rations, sheep rations for feeding out uh, sh sheep and goats have ammonium chloride. We want to make sure we don't buy a feed and then mess it up by adding something else to it. If you buy a, a lamb or a goat feed, don't add corn to it. That feed that you bought is balanced for calcium and phosphorus. You add corn to it, you just added a feed that has lots of phosphorus and very little calcium. Don't mess the feeds up. Don't add things to them. The only thing you should add to a complete feed in that animal's diet is roughage. If you don't believe much of what I've said and you're still concerned that your show weather or pet is going to get urinary calculi and you, you're just convinced that you need to castrate it late, that's okay. Just don't let the breeder do it and don't you do it, make sure a veterinarian does it while that goat or lamb is under sedation and so that it receives pain relief. So late castration should be done by a veterinarian. Okay, the next practice I'm gonna talk about is disbudding. Disbudding is we, when we destroy the horn cells to prevent the horns from growing. It is not the same as dehorning. Much like docking was only for sheep, disbudding is only for goats. It is not customary to disbud or dehorn sheep. The only time we mess with the horns on sheep is when they break or start growing into their head and we're forced to do something about those horns. Why disbud? Goats are generally a horned animal. However, if you, you do occasionally get some polled goats, when you breed two naturally polled goats together, there is a risk of getting hermaphrodism, which is when an animal has both sexual organs. It is very common to disbud dairy goats and other goats that will be handled frequently or be kept in close quarters. We disbud goats for reasons of safety. Horned goats can cause injury to people and to other goats. They are more likely to get their heads stuck in fences. They are more likely to destroy your facilities. Some goats require goats to be disbudded. Certainly the dairy goat shows do. In the old days, when meat goats first started to be shown, they required disbudding. I don't think any shows do anymore. Some breeds require disbudding for registration. And in, and in some cases, you just have a personal preference or, or somebody that wants to buy your goats wants them disbudded. Why would you not disbud? As I mentioned, it is natural for goats to have horns. Horns serve as a natural cooling mechanism and defense mechanism. I think this is more important in wild goats, but it is, is essentially um, the way they were made. It is not customary to disbud meat goats or fiber goats like angoras or goats that are raised extensively, meaning we don't see them much, we don't handle them much, we don't touch them much. There's no reason to disbud them or if they're going to go to market early. So if you're raising meat goats for the market, their horns are not gonna be that big by the time you market them. If you seek any sort of animal welfare certification uh, for your production, disbudding is not likely to be allowed. Uh, and you may have a personal preference, you may simply like goats with horns. So disbudding is a skilled procedure. It is more skilled than I'd say docking and castrating or even tubing. In the United Kingdom, only a veterinarian may perform the procedure. So the most common and recommended method of disbudding is with an electric disbudding iron like you see here on the right. The circular tip should be about three quarters of an inch in diameter. The wattage varies by manufacturer. It's not recommended that you use an extension cord to power the tool. For disbudding, we usually put the kid in a disbudding box with its head sticking out. You can see a picture of one on the right. Making disbudding boxes is a great uh, project for 4-H clubs. I remember doing that years ago. Normally, you clip the area around the horn buds. You place the circular iron over each horn bud. The iron is held for eight to 15 seconds, depending upon the instructions of the manufacturer. What you get when you're done is what you see on the left. You see that copper ring 
around the horn buds if the procedure has been properly done. You can see the goats on the right. Uh, they're, the one on the left was just done. The one on the right, they've had a few days since they had it done. Afterwards, it's a good idea to put an antiseptic on the horn buds. Timing is everything. Here, it's not just a recommendation like it is for docking and castrating. Here, if you don't do it at the right time, it's not gonna work. Kids should be disbudded as soon after birth as possible, but this is based on the appearance of the horn buds. It's usually between three and seven days. The exact timing will depend on the breed, the sex, and the goat, but you're gonna wanna disbud as soon as those buds can be distinguished. Welfare considerations for disbudding, again, like docking and castrating, it does cause some pain. Again, you need to do it at the proper time. You need to make sure the iron is hot enough. You need to, uh, you're not trying to fry their heads. Don't press too hard. Don't hold that iron on for too long. You don't want to overheat that kid's head. And like docking and castrating, ideally you would provide some pain relief, but this will require a veterinary involvement. If you've never disbudded, if you've never castrated, I would say give it a try. I mean, I mean it's okay to do or dock, but if you've never disbudded, you really ought to get the assistance of an experienced producer. And usually our dairy goat producers are the most uh, experienced and skilled or a veterinarian. Um, it's better to, to have somebody work with you the first time you do it. They are actually trying to find methods of disbudding that are chemical. And I don't mean like a paste, but I mean an injection. So there's a few studies that have been done. What about dehorning? Dehorning is removing the horns after they have formed from the horn bud. Quite different than disbudding. But you'll see on the internet, they'll use the terms disbudding and dehorning uh, synonymously. They are not. There are many physical methods of horn removal. They scoop them out, they cut them out, they use paste, uh, banding. None of them are especially pleasant. Once again, I mentioned the calicrate bander, uh, the high tension bands. They have been advocated for horn removal. Um, you know, I, I haven't read any research done with them, but certainly on their website they advocate it with testimonials. Dehorning is not recommended in general. If you didn't disbud the kids, I like to say, well, you missed your opportunity. Disbudding is far preferable to dehorning. Uh, tipping is another option. Uh, this is a requirement we had at our state fair when I started the meat goat show there. It just means kind of cutting the tip, the points off. Uh, those horns have blood vessels in them. They have a good supply of blood. So we would just tip them so they wouldn't be as sharp. If you insist on having the horns removed from an older animal, uh, it should be done by a veterinarian. The last thing I wanna talk about is identifying. Here I'm basically talking about uh, ear tagging and tattooing, but putting some sort of identification, both the individual animal as well as your farm. So why do we identify sheep and goats? This is the one I do to every animal. So I tube when I have to, and I identify every animal but I do not dock, I do not castrate, and I do not disbud. When I had goats, I did not, I did a mixture of disbudding. So we identify sheep and goats to tell them apart. Where you tell yourself, you know, I only have four and I can tell them apart. Well, so suppose somebody's taking care of them for you. It's nice to have an identification on them. Uh, for record keeping, if you register an animal, it's gonna require uh, identification. Uh, if the animal is a 4-H or FFA project, it's going to require identification. If you need to get health papers, uh, even for just an, a petting farm, you're going to need identification. And scrapey identification is mandatory, and I'm going to talk about what that is. So there's a lot of different ways to identify sheep and goats. There are permanent methods and there are temporary methods. I do a lot of temporary methods at times. Sometimes I just need to mark an animal for a short period of time, and there you can see some of the um, options. A lot of dairy goats will be uh, identified just using a neck chain with a number on it. Um, it is a temporary method, but it can seem like it's a permanent method as long as that, that number stays with the goat. Typically what we mean by a permanent method of identification is usually an ear tag or a tattoo. 
You'll notice I have electronic identification as one of the choices, and then yellow will probably eventually become mandatory for animal traceability. I'm on a national committee right now looking at, uh, at electronic identification, and I do think at some point it will be mandatory. Now, if you have a pet, pet animal that you keep and it dies on your place, you know, it's not going to need any type of identification. But if anything moves off your farm, they need to probably be identified, and eventually that may be electronic. Talk a little bit about official scrapie identification. Scrapie is a disease that sheep and goats get. It is in the same family of diseases as mad cow disease. We have been trying to eradicate scrapie for a long time. We're making excellent progress within the last uh, decade or two. And one of the reasons is because of mandatory scrapie identification. Almost all sheep and goats have to have premise identification before leaving their place of origin, where they were born, okay? So if you have a lamb or kid that's born on your farm and it never leaves your farm, you're okay. The other exception is if that animal goes directly to slaughter. So you raise a lamb or kid to put in your freezer, it is not necessary that it has scrapie identification if it goes directly to slaughter. If it goes to the lake, local sale barn, it's going to require identification. Uh, if you look at the picture of the goat here, uh, this side of the tag gives the premise ID for that goat. The, on the other side will be the individual, individual animal's name. So you have a premise identification that traces to your farm, and then there's an individual identification on that animal it is unlawful to remove that tag. So if you ever buy an animal with a scrapie tag, you are not to remove that tag. Tattoos are permissible for registered animals so long as the registration papers accompany that animal. So if the animal goes to the county fair um, and you have the registration papers, that's fine. If that animal goes to the sale barn, they're probably going to want more than a registration paper. It, it just depends. They're probably going to want a tag. You're supposed to keep records for five years on all these on scrapey tags and numbers. It used to be you could get free tags in an applicator. Uh, no longer can you get the metal tags that they originally had, which you don't want anyhow. Now, if you're new, you can get up to 100 plastic tags free of charge for first time participants until the money runs out. They've been providing tags for a long time. To get a premise ID number and to order free tags or to order tags, there's the 800 number that you would need to call. If you have babies born on your place, you don't have to tag them until they leave the farm. So this identification is required when they leave the farm, whether they go to the sale barn, whether they go to a, you know, your church for a petting farm, uh, you know, whatever they leave for, you sell them to somebody, it's when they leave that they need to have that identification. So ear tags are the most common method of identification. Um, they come in many different designs, shapes, colors, sizes. They're made of brass, aluminum, or plastic. They are buttons, swivels, looping, two-piece tags, one-piece tags. You can custom print the tags. You can, on my farm, I have, uh, I have my scrapey ID along with my individual farm ID on my tag. Whatever tag you use is a matter of personal preference. Usually, different tags require different applicators. You need to make sure that you properly use the right equipment and properly put the tag in because you want the tag to stay in and you want to minimize the potential for ear infections. One of the most important parts, uh, aspects of ear tagging is to make sure you properly restrain the animal. That's, that's the key to just about everything I've talked about tonight is you want to properly restrain the animal. But what can happen if you don't properly restrain it and you ear tag it, you can get that tag to rip that entire and split that entire ear. And I have had that happen before. Make sure you use the right applicator for the right tag. Sometimes you can use a, a different applicator, but generally speaking, you want to use the, the one that's sold for those tags. You want to make sure that applicator is working properly. It usually has a sharp pin that's going to uh, where the male part of the tag will fit. You want to make sure that pin is not damaged. You want to put the tag in the tagger and 
not necessarily cl tag, close it completely, but you want to make sure that the male and female parts of the tag are lined up. It's important that you place the tag in the proper part of the ear. You want to avoid the veins or arteries. You can see the pictures here going on either side of the veins or the arteries. You, don't, you want to go no more than two inches from the skull. You want the male part to be on the inside of the ear. If you're using a looping tag, meaning a one-piece tag, you want to put that on the top of the ear and you want to make sure you allow room for that ear to grow. So you don't want it to be snug when you put it on. Put the tag in the center of the ear. This is a picture of what not to do. You want to ideally tag lambs and kids instead of mature animals. You want to avoid tagging during fly season, late spring to summer. That's why in actuality for babies, it's probably better to tag them when they are young. I tag mine when they are um, a, couple, a day or two old. You don't want to tag dirty or wet ears. You will find that you'll get more infections with metal tags. So when they stop providing metal tags for the scrapie program, I think that was a really good thing. We did a buck test for 11 years and every time somebody had metal tags, they were almost always resulted in infections. They say round tags cause more infections. Um, I didn't have an experience that, but that's what they say. You can apply an, an antibiotic, fly repellent, or disinfectant to an ear or tag before applying them. You can dip the tagger in a disinfectant between animals. You want to make sure you store your tags properly and don't use dirty tags. The last uh, subject is tattooing. So this is another common method of identifying, especially goats. Uh, it's a more permanent identification than ear tags because we do lose ear tags. Some ear tags have better retention than others, but uh, the only true permanent would be tattooing and a, um, some sort of implant. Uh, the electronic ID can be implanted under the skin uh, in fact, this is common with some of the meat goat associations. Some registries will require tattooing. It does qualify as scrapie ID, as I indicated, when it's accompanied by a registration certificate. Very often, maybe less so in dairy goats, but in sheep, usually a second form of identification, a more visual form of identification is provided. It it's harder to see tattoos. They are permanent, but it is harder to see them. So very often a second form of identification is put on. And there are different size uh, numbers, different size tattoo numbers. So just like the ear tagger, you want to put the numbers on the pliers and, and um, test that piece of equipment out. You can tattoo a, a piece of paper or cardboard to make sure you've got everything the way you want it. Again, proper restraint is essential. Clean the ear with alcohol and apply ink generously to the ear using a paste type or roll on. Place the symbols parallel to and between veins or cartilage of the ear, just like an ear tag. Squeeze pliers firmly, then pull straight away, and then apply another layer of ink, and that will heal in five to 21 days. Uh, green ink is best, especially for the darker ears, and you can see in this picture a, a pretty good tattoo. So that concludes talking about these five potential management practices that you may do with lambs or kids. And again, only do it if you have to. There's no right or wrong on any of these. With the exception of, of there being a law that animals have scrapie identification once they leave the farm or their place of birth, there, the rest of them, there is no right or wrong whether you choose to do them. The important thing is to do them if it's appropriate to do them at the right time and to do them right. And I 
thank everyone for their attention this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right.